This broadcast is about restoration and God's grace. However, throughout the broadcast, we need to give you some background about Dr. Hugh Fortson Jr.'s story. Therefore, some images may be disturbing. Please be advised. Get ready for Cindy Davis and Friends presents My Story, His Glory, featuring your host, Cindy Davis and Whitney Montgomery. Our guest today survived one of the most horrific experiences in American history at the hands of cult leader Jim Jones. Dr. Hugh Forson Jr. lost his then wife, Rhonda Forson, and their son, Hugh Ishii Fortson. However, Dr. Forson Jr. survived to tell his story of restoration and God's grace. Stay tuned, we will be back to talk to Dr. Forson, but first take a look. Jonestown was the scene of the most horrific tragedies in American history. On November 18, 1978, at the direction of cult leader Jim Jones, over 900 men, women, and children, members of the People's Temple, died from cyanide poisoning, a revolutionary suicide that included over 200 children. It was the largest mass suicide in modern history. Jones was increasingly accused of fraud, physical abuse of his members, and so a paranoid Jones moved People's Temple to Guyana to build a socialist utopia. And thank you for tuning in to Cindy Davis Presents My Story, His Glory. I'm Cindy Davis Evans. And I'm Whitney Montgomery. Our guest, Dr. Hugh Forson Jr. Welcome to the broadcast to mm -hmm. tell your story. My pleasure to be here. And it's such a pleasure to have you here. Dr. Forson, um, first I want to say my condolences to your family. Thank you. That who were lost at the hands of Jim Jones. Right. Back in 1978. Yes. And since then, God has restored you. Amen. Thank God for that. Can you tell us a little bit about what background you had? What religion denomination were you before you encountered uh, the People's Temple? Actually, I was uh, in the Episcopal Church after I graduated from high school, and I had one time during that, I thought I wanted to become an Episcopal priest. I changed my mind because it, it, was, it seemed like they weren't really touching on the social issues in the community at the time, at least that's what I thought. And it, uh, my mom had told me about Jim Jones and People's Temple. She was oh. impressed because it was an interracial choir, and there were old people, young people, middle-aged people, and all different uh, kinds of people that were there. So I went down, actually, initially, to try to disprove what she saw. I was going to find uh -huh. the hole. Oh. I went two times by myself, and each time I went, I got kind of reeled in because the man was talking about social issues. I wasn't much into the healings. I watched it, but it didn't excite me because I'd never really been in that arena. But I got hooked because of the social issues that he was talking about. So that's what kind of grabbed me. Uh, later, I guess after about three or four times, I, I took my then girlfriend, Rhonda. We went together because we were both uh, dating there at the Episcopal Church. And after maybe about five times, we made a decision because we were p making plans to get married that we would in fact become part of this because we felt like we could help people within the organization. And so we jumped in hook, line, and sinker. And what type of social issues were, was he talking about at that time, though, that got your attention? Okay. Uh, they had made claim that they had two senior citizen homes that they had put together, that senior citizens who couldn't afford proper care, they were caring for them. They had a, a drug rehab program, and at that time we're talking about LSD and heroin, that supposedly 200 people, young people, had gotten delivered off of these drugs and were now becoming productive wow. members in their society. Uh, they had wanted to start food programs, which they did in the Bay Area and uh, mm -hmm. I think Redwood Valley for a while. L.A. didn't quite get kicked off as much. Mm -hmm. And he would talk about the, the things that were in the news, uh, Vietnam War, 
uh, the, the president at the time, <laughs> whether it was Lyndon Bain Johnson or Nixon, he was talking about them. And anything he saw negative within our individual communities that even preachers was doing, he would bring it out publicly. Like if a preacher got caught in uh, maybe uh, a scandal, mm -hmm. he would bring it out publicly. And he would say publicly, well, you know, Pastor John Doe, he did mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. and I'm challenging him. And if I'm a liar, then you come see me. I'm a man. I'm a real man. And so with that, you're like, wow, this is different. You know, you, you don't hear this much. Um, he always used to say that he wanted to be black and he would say that he was an Indian and he could relate to black people's problems. And so with that, a lot of people said, well, well, maybe he's talking about something that we can kind of relate to. And mind you, most of his, I wouldn't even call them sermons because he would use this much of scripture and then the rest was stuff that he got from the LA Times, the New York Times, the uh, Sentinel newspaper, uh, Life magazine, Time magazine. He take bits and pieces and weave it together. And his so-called sermon would last from anywhere from 40 minutes to two hours. Yes. So wow. that was relatable to yeah. people because it was the current events. Exactly. And okay. Exactly. But he always would end up saying that what we need to do as poor black and white people, if we would begin to pool our monies together and work together, we could build a brand new society where there'd be no racism, where there'd be no hunger, uh, where people that needed housing, we could provide housing for them. So it all sounded good. And that's what he did. It, he moved you guys to a place, correct? To Yes. To do that, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The place he came up with, uh, which we didn't know he had already went down and kind of scoured out the land, it was first called uh, People's Temple Agricultural okay. Mission. That we were going to go down and we were going to help support the Guyanese people in that region, which was in the middle of a jungle. Wow. About 37,000 acres of nothing but green heart, purple heart trees, 150 feet high hardwoods and jungle. We talk about we're talking about small snakes, we're talking about small tigers, we're talking about <laughs> little bitty uh marabona ants that would bite you and my God. We're talking about the deep real deep jungle, jungle yeah. of Guyana. This man couldn't touch this. <laughs> I'm serious. It was real deal. But they went in and cleared the land and began to build and the Guyanese people first said that we were crazy, mm -hmm. but then after a couple of years, they realized that we had something going, going on. on yeah. <laughs> so what did you give up besides your freedom to follow Jim Jones to Guyana? Uh, you know, and this is hindsight. I could say I gave up my manhood mm -hmm. because I listened to him. Uh -huh. I followed him because wow. Now, mind you, even though I had doubts every now and then that would come up in my spirit, but I wasn't willing to say, you know what, wait a minute, dude, something's not right with this picture. How come? Because he always presented himself as, I'm the ultimate leader. I'll be your friend. I'll, I'll be your, not only your friend, I could be your ally in whatever you're going through. I'll be there. So he attempted to make himself like a self, real God right here on earth. But yet and still, there were still some flaws in him. Right. But oh. we didn't talk about that because he always said, no, you don't, you don't talk about your leader. You know? Oh, I see. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it would be hard for anyone to stand up against him at any point because you guys kept that quiet, basically. If, I'm sure other people had doubts, too. You know, everybody has that kind of discernment, maybe felt something but didn't speak up. Every now and then, there would be one lone soldier that would stand up and say, okay. well, I disagree and he would belittle them in a public setting okay. to make them feel like dirt, and then after making them feel like dirt, or if they decided that they still were going to be very adamant about it, then he'd say, you better sit down, and he would use a few four-letter words, <laughs> or either I'm going to have uh, folk come up and kick your blah, 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 and that would sometime happen. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But yes. we all looked at it as, well, the greater good for the greater number. That's what right. he used to say. Because, see, he was trying to tie in mm -hmm. socialism and communism along with folk 
who were from the <laughs> local ghetto who knew nothing about that, but were trying something new to see if it would work in order to really help people. Yeah. In one sense, he was helping people. In another sense, he was putting people right under his thumb where he wanted us. Right. I heard that he uh, actually threw the Bible away or threw the Bible out. Oh, or oh that was a unique. He, when, the man should have gotten Academy Award. I was there that service. You were at that service yes, when he ma'am. threw the Bible away? There in Los Angeles wow. at the, what we call the L.A. Temple on Alvarado. And maybe about 3,000 people were in this huge building lined up with chairs as well because all the pews were filled. And he took the Bible and he walked down the aisle and he said, you see this Bible? Mm -hmm. He said, this Bible has held down black people for the last 200 wow. years. They taught you to believe in this Bible. He said, and I'm gonna use Flip Wilson as an example. Mm -hmm. What you see is what you get. You see me, I, if you need a home, I'll take you into a home. If you need food, I'll make sure you get fed. If you need clothes, I'll make sure you get clothes now, not later in the by and by. And he lifted it up. He said, you see this Bible? And he reared back like, like a football player. And uh -huh. he threw it. And the whole place was like, oh. Silence. And he stood there. I'm telling you, the man, master manipulator. And he waited till it hit the ground. Boom. And he waited a few moments. He said, now, did you see any fire come from heaven and strike me dead? He said, that Bible has no power. He said, if anything, you ought to take those pages and use it to wipe your... And wow. everybody's like, oh. some were offended. Others start scratching their head like, hmm. Why did you stay? Why would you stay after he threw, or, or, or not just you, but any other one? Did anyone leave after they saw him throw away the Bible? A few actually did, but for the most part, we, we, I personally sat there and scratched my head. I said, okay, all right, let's see if I can figure this out. I wasn't that deep into the word. I wasn't in a relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that. Yeah. All I knew that God was good and I didn't know much of the word and I'm not blaming on the Episcopal Church, I'm blaming on myself because mm -hmm. I didn't research. Yes. So we, we sat and we said, okay, let's see what's next. Because he always had something coming up behind it. He had to top that. Uh -huh. uh, then he'll take it to the spiritual where he, he actually one time, now mind you, this was a, a beautiful wooden, had the, the mahogany tables, I mean, uh, uh, pews, and the pulpit had mahogany lined up. Mm -hmm. And one time he held his hands up. Now mind you, we had no idea that his nurse, one of his nurses apparently had given him one of those little things like you prick yourself when you're a diabetic. Mm -hmm. And so blood was coming out. Okay see the blood coming out of my hands, trying to relate himself to Jesus. Uh -huh. So he took the blood and rubbed it on this and said, if you truly believe in what I'm doing to help feed hungry people, come and donate money. And people are coming up destroying money over the pulpit, thousands of dollars. That was kind of my question on how he was how he was funded or how he did all these things that he promised. You know, he's promising, I'll get you food, I'll get you, where was he being financed as far as? The people. Okay. As far as we know, it was a people, because if that didn't work, then after he took a, had taken that offering, he'd come back again. We found the, the, the treasurer told me that we were short today. We need to raise money. Folk, we got 11 Greyhound buses full of people that came from other parts of California to be in this meeting to help to build. We need to build, and this was even before Jonestown. Right. Now, I personally used to have to go in because I worked in the LA Temple, and mm -hmm. a good weekend would be anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand dollars they'd rake in. Wow! But he would take three or four offerings, and each time he'd have another plea. Or oh, we just got a phone call. There's a mother and her children being thrown out, and we need to take them in, and we need to find them. So folk would start re-giving again. Guilt, condemnation. Right. The, the condemnation, kept... and you know all of the all and of the tricks in fear. Yeah. Take us inside the compound. Okay. Inside. All right. Uh, in Jonestown itself, mm -hmm. there was uh, uh, what they call the pavilion where most of the people lost their lives. Pavilion was the central meeting location for everybody. Uh, and mind you, there was a small stage that was built and I would call it like an old lounge chair made out of wood mm -hmm. where he would sit like his little throne, mm -hmm. and he'd have his table with water, drinks, juices, 
uh, his medications, even though he said he wasn't sick, but they were constantly giving him meds all the time. And some of it was stuff to keep him high. Right. And to keep other bedroom activities going yeah. too. So in that, uh, around were the huts that were built, and the huts were maybe like about, i say about a 12 by maybe 15. Mm -hmm. But within that, because see the promise was once you get there, you'd have your own hut. Right. Not true. When I got there, um, my wife was sent back to Georgetown to work, and we were responsible for about eight young men who had mental problems, who were, who were bad dudes, okay? okay? They were youngsters, but they just had attitudes. So right. that meant part of our room was being shared with these young men in bunk beds. And the married couples, mm -hmm. the married couples, two, four, about six, six to eight of them were in, in bunk beds. And your privilege was you could take a curtain and you wow. cover yours up. But see, this was a sacrifice that we were supposed to make till everybody got to freedom. And then once you were there, what could you do? You go, hey, I don't like the living quarters, send me home. No, he said, nobody can go home right now. Because they had let some people go back in the early days, like in the late 77, and they came back and began to complain. Now the toilet, we had toilet facilities. However, that was a big building that was split down the middle and there were carved out holes. Mm -hmm. It was like out of house, mm -hmm. about nine of them on each side. Mm -hmm. Now. What he did psychologically to the men, all of the men, whether you did number two or number one, mm. you had to sit down. Now, if oh, you were- Oh, the men Yes, too? in the men's side. Wow. Now, if you were ever caught standing up doing the number one, you would be on the floor that <laughs> night. Are you serious? Um, serious as a heart attack. Oh, because my God. Because he wanted you to understand that he was the only true man. He was the only one that could bring forth boy babies only. That's what he used to, that was oh, his wow. claim to fame. Oh, how did you escape? There were over 900 men, women, and children who yes. were killed at the hands of Jim Jones. How did you escape? It was, it was totally God. It was not me. Um, I was walking in fear. My, the fears that I had, I couldn't even talk to my wife because he had already programmed all of us that if my wife were to come to me and say she had some doubts about something, my responsibility as part of the temple was to go to him directly and mm -hmm. say, Rhonda's saying something negative and vice versa with me. Mm -hmm. Couples had did it and they would be on the floor and he'd blast them and make them feel guilty. All the stuff that I've done for you. I, I, I took care of your children. I took care of you. I sent my lawyers to jails to get your bad children out of jail, but he didn't use it in quite those words. So as it were, one night in the, out of the clear blue, and this had to be September 1978, early September, mm -hmm. and uh, he came out on the loudspeaker and he said, uh, uh, I want your attention. It was almost 11 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to be sending three people back stateside, but the stipulation will be that if either one of you have heard either one of these persons say anything negative about your leader or this cause, come to me personally, they would not be going. He said, one will, first one will be Marcin Jones, my wife. He said, and you know that we no longer have relationship. We're working for the cause. He had built himself another hut on the other side of Jonestown. When I first arrived, like in late, uh, about mid-April, 1978. And with that particular home, he had several women that were uh, like his concubines. And he pointed them out one day, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. In other words, you don't mess with them. Right. He did that publicly. And he said, if she said anything negative about your leader, this cause, coming in person, she would not be going. He said, and I'm sending Hugh Fortson as her personal bodyguard, which I was shocked. I had no idea this was coming down the pipe. And he said, he's going to also be the minister in charge, meant nothing about real ministry. Right. That was a title this that we title. used when we got back here in the States so the so-called authorities would stay off of us. And I was supposedly doing research on supplies because they were going to build a, uh, a wood uh, furniture making shop down there in Jonestown. But they had, you know, stuff they were looking for. And the third person was uh, uh, one of his women, uh, Carolyn. So that's how you was able to, because you weren't there, you were in... Exactly. You were in Not the there States. With the big yeah. yeah, you weren't there at the time. Yeah. 
of yeah. the of the cyanide poisoning. Now he called. He came to me personally a few days after that, and he said, uh, "You know, he always wanted to make you feel good." He said, "You're one of the few young blacks that I can trust, so you take care of Marcelin, but it'll only be for two months because I know you're gonna miss your wife and baby." See, he always played divide and conquer because he knew. Being over there, I wouldn't be foolish enough to go and tell the authorities because I didn't know what was going to happen to Ronda and Ishii. Either way, it was a gamble, and I still lost in that respect. Um, and so September 17th, she and I flew to uh, New York and from New York to San Francisco. And we lived within the temple because they had already created living spaces within this huge building that used to be a nightclub of some kind years ago. And in that... It was very interesting because I went with her and she went to visit his uh, political constituents within the Bay Area and a few in LA. And I'm sitting in this room with her and she's sharing how uh, his former um, assistant DA out of Northern California and his wife were having marital problems. And this was his words. He said that uh, he was a transvestite and he was dressed in women's clothing and he wasn't satisfying her in the bedroom. So he asked his wife, could he go in and minister to her to save this man's career? And supposedly she agreed and out of that came John Victor Stone, the baby boy. Okay. And from that, that was supposedly they, now his words were they brought the child and left the child. And okay. that brought on uh, Congressman Leo Ryan the concerned right. relatives and all that came in. And we were supposed to go back in two months. And it was interesting because early November, she came to me personally, his wife, and said they, whoever they was, said for her to come back. And they said and asked, which actually they were saying, for me to stay for one more month. And then they would send someone to relieve me. And she left, and a week and a half later, November the 18th is when... She lost her life, and I was still in San Francisco. Mm, I'm so sorry to hear about that. What would you say to people who have lost and they feel like it's their fault, who have lost a loved one and they feel like it's their fault? How did you get over that? How did you deal with that and um, overcome that? For years, I guess for about the first almost... 16, 17 years after the tragedy, every time it got to November, I would go into an area of depression. Yes. I even took myself to a uh, mental health clinic down in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and I walked in and told them, hey, I'm crazy, I need to talk to somebody. But God was in the midst of it, Amen. because the young man that I sat and began to pour my heart out to, he looked at me, and afterward he said, well, you know what, you're not crazy. He said, mm -hmm. I just think you made the wrong decisions, he said, if I were you, I would suggest that you go back to church and start over again. Yes. Just take your time. Yes. And so I followed that, and eventually I got to the place where I, uh, Lord blessed me to a job. I was constantly working and going to church, trying to fit my life back together, uh, all the way up to 1980, 86, when I met my wife. Now, God caused that to happen. Um, but mm -hmm. guilt and condemnation was a thing that was riding on me because I felt bad because not only Ronda and Ishi, my personal family, but those 900 and something other people, a lot of them I'd worked with, a lot of my I had moved them out of their houses, took them to Social Security, or took them to a uh, passport office to get their passports, yes, all, all this all kind those, of stuff. You had relationship together yes, with everybody. Yeah, I did. You were up I, I knew them personally, family. you know, on a one-on-one. -on -one. So in that... For years, I kept carrying that, and, and finally, I, I literally got delivered, and I would, it's kind of hard to suggest it. I mean, I would pray for them. That's what led me into ministry, because now some of my gifting is the same thing. I recognize those gifts, uh, yes. rejection, guilt, and condemnation. The Lord gives those. it to me, and we pray, and they get delivered from it, because it's, it's a thing. It's a real thing that yes. folk in the churches, especially in church and out of the church, need to be delivered from. And that's what began to renew my life and God restored my life in that he brought yes. another woman which I didn't feel I was worthy to have because of the ignorance I had back then. Mm -hmm. And from that, we now have six grown children 
and four grandchildren oh, now. That's and wonderful. all of six of our children have calls on their lives oh, you know, to work for the that, Lord. That is absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. God will restore. Yes, yes, He will. How does one recognize they are in a cult? When they can see that this leader, male or female, begin to talk that I syndrome. Mm -hmm. I do this. I do it this way. I do it that way. When they begin to move away from the basic principles of teaching the Word of God and not making it work for them or, or changing the words out of it or using just a piece of scripture and the rest is, is their philosophy right, about right. life and how we should live it. When they start moving away from that, when they move away from prayer. From the gospel, the from, from, gospel from the gospel of Jesus. Of Jesus when they it. take Jesus out of the foundation. Right. Yes, and, that's it. And start adding other things because there are a lot of uh, churches that are going political issues and their exactly. whole sermon is about something political or something true. or something that's going their on beliefs, in the world. Not necessarily what the word says about yes. that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Their and beliefs, you know, aside from what Jesus right. have taught us. That's a very strong indicator right there. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, uh, what can I do? What can I do? I would suggest you pray and move away from it because it has a tendency to hook you. Right. If you're not a sound in your in understanding what the real doctrine of Jesus oh. Christ is for yourself, you're going to be sucked in and you'll sit there like, okay, I can't get away right. because it is, it is a controlling spirit mm -hmm. that goes along with that. That's what he had. I mean, I saw times when folks would come in angry, wanting to jump on this man, but by the end of that meeting, he had changed their, he had changed their mindset. Mm -hmm. And they were one of his best followers, and they would die for him. Uh -huh. That's why a lot of them died with him. Do you mm -hmm. still have anybody that you talk to, uh, any other survivors that you um, have relationship with? Or? They're, 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 they're afraid of me. And I'm not saying that to build myself up because they know my, my agenda is I can lead you to the Lord. I can strengthen you. I, I can tell you what you need to do, but you have to want to have right. it. I can't force you. Um, uh, the few that I have met down through the years, they don't want any part of any kind of church, church at all. Okay. And that's understandable. Oh, that is so it's sad. Crazy. It's understandable, yeah. but it's so sad too. Because yes, I think, is. you know, from, from the beginning, you have to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus said, come and follow me. Exactly. And, but you have to know the word for yourself. Open the word and you have to know it for, your, for yourself. Very you true. Know? But, but we must admit, uh, I too, know. a lot yeah. of us were lazy. Right. We, we let him do the thinking for us, in the word, in our lives, and it ended up like it's supposed to, unfortunately, mm -hmm. in disaster of mm -hmm. people's lives. Because mm -hmm. that's what the enemy does, kill, steal, and destroy. Mm -hmm. What did they do with the compound? Like after the suicide, how did they, did they evacuate the bodies? Did, I mean, was it just yeah. a... Yeah, how did they decompose of the bodies? Right. Oh, it was a lot of you, people. <laughs> you, you love this one. Now, you figure it out. Um, mind you, on the 17th of November, 1978, we had saw the newscast where the late Congressman Leo Ryan was saying, Jim, if 100 people left tonight, it wouldn't be a bad mark against you. Because they had showed him all the nice things about Jones. Right. So we were excited. Okay, maybe, you know, the, the attacks that we've been having and stuff would be gone. Mm -hmm. The next day, I happened to be walking through the building, and about 9-something that morning, the phone rang. Mm -hmm. I was close to it, the church phone, so I picked it up. It was the late Mayor Moscone. And he asked me who I was, and he introduced himself, and I told him who I was, and then he said, uh, uh, I've got a confirmed report mm -hmm. from the FBI, the 18, that there are 400 bodies in Jonestown. Do you know what happened? And I'm saying, like, what? Wow. No, we haven't heard a thing. He says, okay. He says, well, I'm going to send over the police chief and some members of the council of churches to talk with you all. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So I gave the approval without talking to anybody. So I physically, verbally got jumped on wow. before they got there. So when they came in, they, they were trying to find out if we had the same mindset that we as wanted to do, quote-unquote, the white knight, as it was put out. That was the, the code name that Jones gave it to us because he wanted to make the world feel guilty by them making us do this. But he, he lied again uh, in the process. He said, if we give our lives tonight, 
he was going to resurrect everybody in the morning. Wow. Oh, now, people, yeah, wow. he did. Now, people laugh, ah, oh, you wouldn't believe that. But see, if you've been programmed I was like, to you, believe, yeah, their minds have been. The mindset had already been programmed that, okay, this man can heal, this man can deliver people. Mm -hmm. But he had flaws in his own self. Right. He had fears his own self mm -hmm. that he wasn't dealing with. Wow. Um, that is such a sad commentary. What would you say to people who are, um, have given up on God, have given up on church? I would say that one one person has to have a relationship and know the Lord for themselves. Mm. It doesn't matter what church we go to or don't go to. And it'd be good if you go because you need to go to get learned. Of. You need to learn of the Bible if you don't know it. But it's all about knowing him, having that one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. Have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That in the beginning... He said, let us make man in thy image and likeness was there. And he's there to teach you if you would let him in. But see, a lot of time we think with this instead of the spirit. Right. And yes. that's where we get in trouble mm. because we're trying to outthink him. Okay, mm -hmm. we may have computers that we didn't have back then, but mm -hmm. we have them now. But he never left. Everything that made now, Jesus Christ knew about it was coming down the pipe mm. and he mm. did it, allowed it to be made so that we could have a better relationship right. with him. But man has gone to the way left and said, well, since I developed these cameras, then I'm God. Right. Uh, I can make these cameras and make money, which will be my God. And look at me, look how big I am. And it starts from there. It starts with a little seed, mm -hmm. but it's corrupt seed. Mm -hmm. So I would say to people, you've got to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship. Now, a lot of times people say, well, I don't like this preacher. This preacher does this. This preacher does that. Sure, there's a lot of people that have fallen from it's grace. Still, yeah. But it takes you praying to God that God will lead you where you need to go to be developed. Because there's gifts in all of us. They mm -hmm. just haven't been developed. So you're saying there is a difference between uh, religion and having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. Religion is man-made. Mm -hmm. I could start a religion tomorrow and design it that would cater to what I think is important. But mm -hmm. that relationship with one-on-one -on -one with the Lord Jesus Christ will give you understanding, and this may sound country, but work with me, <laughs> of <laughs> whose you are oh. and who you are in God. Amen. Very simply. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. it really is. Yeah, yeah, it's and, simple. And we miss it because we try to complicate it with all our stuff that we try to put in it. It's like making a cake and we adding stuff in it. Extra things trying to make it better, there but really we're taking away from there it. There you yeah. go, exactly. So God has restored you. He has restored your, your marriage. He has given you children, yes. grandchildren. God is a restorer. Jesus is a restorer. Yes. And that is the wonderful part about this entire thing is that Jesus is still <laughs> here. He still loves you. Mm -hmm. Wherever you are, whoever you are, that's true. He, loves, he loves you. Yeah. And, I think and he that's... will restore. That's the greatest thing that uh, I get out of all of this is understanding that with all my faults with me believing in a man, uh, I don't think I was at the, the total point of not believing in God. I was distracted looking at this man and his program. Uh -huh. And in that, I lost sight of God, but God was always there. God never left, yeah. I, I, can, I can remember a situation in, in, in the jungle where we had uh, another gentleman and myself were to go to uh, Porikatuma. No, yeah. And that's where we would go once mm -hmm. a month to pick up the baby chicks. Okay. Because by the time we get them back and get them to start to grow up, we're getting ready to slaughter some to feed the community. So y'all did y'all own agriculture. Agriculture, yeah. Yes. Yeah, agriculture but we were and, short and farming. all the time. So we had to do other means. We had to go to uh, catch the train, 
which only went one way, 32 okay. miles away. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, this young man had already done this run before. And he's like, oh, don't worry about it. We'll get there in time. I said, man, what time did the train come? Oh, don't worry about it. So we start walking out of Jonestown. It just passed the gate, and we're walking down this long road to get to the train. And woo, doo, 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 there goes one train going 32 miles by itself. Okay. I looked at him. I said, you know what, dude? I am not going back and tell him that we missed that train because that means those chicks would die by the time we got yeah, there because yeah. they have to be yeah. in their life. Okay. So he said, well, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know about you, but I'm going to walk. <laughs> we oh, yeah. walked 32 wow. miles on that railroad track. No lights, bats, wow. everything, all kind of noises. Just We knew that the track would take us to where we need right. to go. We walked and we got there about 545 the next morning. Mm -hmm. We went to the little hotel. It was already full. The guy came to the door and he said, well, come right, you can come sleep on the floor. So we slept on the floor. It was like a community with mm -hmm. bathrooms in the very back, an old, old wooden building. Mm -hmm. I got up to use the restroom and when I went back there, there was a Guyanese woman who came out of one stall. So I just spoke to her. I wasn't trying to flirt, I just spoke. <laughs> I went into the restroom. When I came out, she was standing with her man, and he had his hand behind him like this. How you doing, comrade? You call everybody comrade. How you doing, comrade? So I shared with him we had missed the train, da da da. So I turned to walk away to go on back to go to sleep for a little while before we went to go get these chickens and a Land Rover to take us back. And when I turned back, look out of the corner of my eye. He had a piece in his hands because he thought I was hitting on this woman. So I guess he was going to shoot me. And I'm like, oh, my God, Jesus. Oh. Wow. So once again, so, you know, the mercy of God kept, kept me because I could have been gone right there. Yeah, and God has kept you to yes. tell your story. To tell your story. To yeah. tell your story yes. for yes. his glory. And tell us a little bit about your ministry. And what is the name of your ministry? The name of the ministry that the Lord gave me has just been about a good almost 18 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, in His Habitation Ministries Trauma Center. Mm -hmm. okay. When we first started in the home, and well, in our little two bedroom apartment, mm -hmm. He says, um, I want you to have a prayer fellowship every other Friday night, but do not take a member. I'm, like, I'm arguing with God. What are you talking about? Every other, every other Friday. Oh, God, every other Friday. Every other Friday. How was it? How did it grow? I mean, how did it begin to grow, people? By word of mouth. <laughs> word I of argued mouth. with God for three weeks. Okay. It didn't make sense to me. I'm like God. First, you tell me to do it every other Friday. Then you tell me don't take no members. What? This how is not a church. Right. We don't, I don't see this. So finally, I said, okay, I'm gonna do it. And but inside, I'm saying it's not gonna work. First <laughs> meeting we had maybe about <laughs> seven people. The next meeting, we didn't put out any flyers, send out any letters. Next thing you know, we got a room full of people. Yeah. And he said, okay, I want you to pray for this one, and I'm going to tell you what's in there that needs to come out. Mm -hmm. And so as I began to listen to what the Holy Spirit was telling me, mm -hmm. I mean, folks were getting healed, getting delivered. He said, and also they will have their ministries loosed. Mm -hmm. Their ministries okay. tied, and all he told me to do was say, ministry loosed. And these folk would go off and do their ministry. He said, don't take a member. So, but we kept getting abundance yeah, yeah. of people for five years. Wow. Would come into five that little, years? We used to have people that would what? come in at 8.30 and didn't go till 4.30 the next morning. And all wow. we were doing was being obedient to which one he said to pray for, which one he said to, to prophesy yeah. to. And they would grab it and run with it. Then after that, we were having a meeting every other third Saturday. And then he challenged us to find a building. We found a building on 64th and Normandy there in Los Angeles, a little storefront. Mm -hmm. And my God from heaven, we had a handful of people at that time that actually came to work with us. And every Thursday, every Sunday night, every Sunday morning, folk would come in from all of the big churches in Los Angeles, healed, delivered, set free, get spirit filled, get mm -hmm. filled with the Holy Spirit, because a lot of them didn't have him. Mm -hmm. But Thursday night, specifically, he said that's Holy Ghost Encounter Night, that they would have an encounter. And it was, it got so hot and heavy. I mean, the sense that the Holy Spirit was moving. He gave me direction. He said, okay, when I start moving, I want you to get out of here because it's about me and not about you. Amen. And I, I would literally run out the door with one brother because folks would follow me outside. <laughs> uh -huh. Pray for me. I'm like, no, 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 no. I gotta me. go. Yeah. I gotta go, I gotta <laughs> go. 
And I wow, actually that's had to do interesting. that. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then from that time up to this day, mm -hmm. wherever he sends us, it's such a move of God that happens in and through me. And I, I keep telling him, it's not me. All I'm doing is being obedient, but I, I'm reminding them it's not me. You'll never make me. I love me that, right. especially with place. what you've been through. Yes. That's like the big the Yes, because see, I know how easy it is to get the big head and yeah, think person. you're all that in a bag of chips. No, like, no, 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 no. That's right. It's all about the I'm Holy gonna Spirit. I'm going to die of natural causes. I'm that's not going right. to go out like that. That's right. And so, but, uh, <laughs> but God is doing, and he's taking us to another place now that he's moved us to the high desert because there's such a, a... Because you're in California. Yes, I'm yes, in California, uh, California, in the desert. Yeah, right? not here. He took, <laughs> us, he took us to the backside of the desert, and he's revamped everything, mm -hmm. and that we're moving in new directions now mm -hmm. to try to get the people back to repentance, because the church has forgot about repenting. And I'm mm -hmm. saying in general, mm -hmm. all they want is, is let's see how many people we can get. Let's see how much building we can get. Right. Let's see what we can do that people will look at us. And it's not about us. It's not it's about, about us. him. It's all about Jesus. Yes. And that's, and that is, that is what he wants us to know. That is all about him. It's yes. not about. That is the message. Yeah. Yeah. That is that's the it. message. That's that is right the now. message. It's that simple, right? Yeah. Cause see, people are looking for a hero now. They they yeah. want a God somewhere yes. here, yeah. just like the people did in, in back in the Book of Samuel. They were looking for a God. God said, "Okay, cool. Here, there you go. I'm gonna give you Saul. Mm -hmm. he gave him Saul, and they were disappointed. They right. were looking They're for a leader. They're always gonna be yes. disappointed. Correct? Exactly. Yeah, always exactly. Be. Well, we'll vote one in. Well, you voted him in, and he is not God. Yeah. Nobody's God. So you got to go back to God. We need to do neology again. Yes. Yeah. Get on the get, knees. Get on the knees. Get on the knees again. That. Get on the knees yeah. and pray. Yeah. Get on That's the knees right. and pray. And then you'll hear from God. So I'm, well, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm, I'm so excited and I'm, I'm, I'm real so appreciative That's that right. you would come all the way from California to be with yes. us today Amen. to That's share. That's reasonable service. Mm, to share about God's love because that's what it's all about. Can you look into your camera there and maybe mm -hmm. pray for someone who is lost or who needs to um, accept Jesus Christ as the Lord? Not religion, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not churchology. Yes. And we're not against any of church, right. any church. Right. We are pushing Jesus, Jesus yes. Christ. Father, I, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for those that are in TV land or, or able to receive this broadcast. And Father, first of all, knowing that it's you and not us. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray for those that are seeking, that are searching. I pray for those that are hurt, that have maybe even got wounded in a church situation. Father, we come against the spirit of guilt and condemnation. Yes. And Father, the love that you showed me and the love that you presented in my heart, Lord, I thank you as you send that forth through the airways yes. that will touch them in spite of I'm not there because it's not me, it's about you. And I knew that there's no distance in space in prayer. There's no distance in space because you are omnipresent and we thank you now as thank you're touching you. those that have been wounded, those that have been hurt, those that thank are you. walking in fear, fear of not having enough, fear of, of, yes. of earthquake, fear of flooding again. Father, we thank you, Lord. The devil is a liar. And Father, we ask in Lord that salvation will go forth to those that need to be saved, healing, deliverance will go forth in the name yes, of Jesus name as we speak Jesus. it. Father, we uh, dispatch your angels yes, that your Father. angels would do the work, would take what they need individually as well as collectively. And Lord, that they will come into the real realization that they need you, Lord Jesus, not religion, but they need you. They need you, the Holy Spirit, to come on the inside and mm -hmm. do the greater works that Jesus has spoke about. And Father, we thank you and we bless your name now as we send out this prayer in the mighty name of Jesus we pray amen and amen 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 we just want to thank you so much for tuning in and if you have a prayer request or if you want to reach out to us um, go to our email and let us know that you heard the message and you received it and our email should be on the screen my story is glory TV at gmail.com. Thank you, Whitney, for being here. You have mm -hmm. anything you want to say? Yeah. And a blessing. And it's such a blessing. We thank you. God bless. Until next time, God Amen. bless.